Uh, good evening to all the blades out there in a very cold and frosty Sheffield uh, and a cold and frosty Bramall Lane but uh, everything's well and good with the pitch tomorrow so don't start panicking as we speak we're fine. Um, welcome our visitors tomorrow Bolton Wanderers uh, and look at uh, some of the history things that have been going off in the uh, the press this week it's the link us and uh, the trotters together really really interested I always find things out that I didn't know um, and I saw that on the uh, Sheffield home of football uh, site which is brilliant um, in midweek it was the anniversary of the 1854 meeting where Michael Ellison put forward the idea for um, a ground to be made for sport to be free from smoke that famous quote that relates back to the living conditions of Sheffield uh, that meeting took place at the Adelphi Hotel and the Duke of Norfolk was uh, was kind enough to offer <coughs> an area of land he got on the uh, little lane called White House Lane, on a 100 year lease at £70 a year rent uh, for the use of cricket and athletics and of course uh, that ground became the Bramall Lane that we know and love today. So 1854, the anniversary this week of the meeting that took place that really set the ball rolling uh, for this famous and historic old stadium to sort of take shape. We're looking at the history of the ground and we talk about it all the time, that's what this blog's all about. Uh, but one of the proud things that Bramall Lane's got amongst many is the fact that back in the days before Wembley, Old Trafford, Villa Park, all these famous super stadiums of today, um, this was the probably the best built stadium in the country at the time uh, and it staged a fair few full England internationals uh, at football. And it sort of got me thinking when we were fortunate enough to announce that for the Rugby World Cup, uh, beautiful downtown Bramall Lane would be uh, including that stage in a game, which is wonderful news. Uh, but it just adds this England uh, lineage and heritage that we've got. Uh, rugby this time, not football, but just as important in its own right. Uh, obviously one of the first ever England football internationals outside of London or Glasgow uh, between England and Scotland took place here at Bramall Lane in 1883. And I was looking back at the international we staged. One of the interesting ones is 1897. Now at that time, of course, our goalkeeper is the much fabled and much talked about William Henry Folks, Fatty Folks. Uh, six foot two inches tall when he signed for the Blades, which in Victorian times was, uh, was a big man. The entire uh, Sheffield United defence played for England and the tallest player was about five feet six inches. So just imagine this towering figure. When he signed for the Blades, he weighed about 12 stones in weight, which uh, people in the know at the club tell me is about right, so it's pretty much the same build as me. Uh, by the time he played his final game for us, he tipped the scales at well over 24 stones in weight. Huge. Uh, one of our biggest characters ever. You can sit and talk about folks for hours and never ever tire of the stories. Some are true, some are based on truth, and some are downright made up, but it doesn't really matter. Um, he's one of our biggest characters ever. Now, he was regarded as the first true football, one of the first true football stars of his day. Um, a bright lad as well, very quote worthy in the newspapers and the press at the time. Um, they could get, uh, they always get a word or two out of folks, and he was pretty switched on to sport, politics, the whole lot. Very outspoken character was our Bill. Now he was selected to play for England, which was a huge honour at that time. And the game he was selected to play in was the game against Wales at Bramall Lane, February 1897. Uh, and the way the teams used to be made up then. There were professional players like Folks, Ernest Needham, the captain of Sheffield United, uh, and a fair smattering of amateurs, uh, the public school boys that played for the clubs like Corinthians and so on. Now, he must have done all right because the game finished 4-0 to England. And there was a Sheffield United player playing for uh, the Welsh team that day at Bramall Lane by the name of Jack Jones, who joined us in about 1895. And he'd been spotted not only for his football, but he was a prodigious cricketer. And what United did to sign him was give him a job during the summer playing for the Sheffield United Cricket Club and then playing football for the Blaze during the winter. Um, and Jones was on the receiving end of a 4-0. And now what that makes that really, really interesting. In fact, we're talking about caps. Back in those days, if you can see that, uh, there weren't that many England internationals. The world was a much bigger place. No airplanes, no motorways. Um, so there was only ever really three international games every year, that'd be against Wales, uh, Ireland, Scotland. And the big cap was Scotland, everybody wanted to be picked uh, to play in the Scotland game for the home internationals, that was the old enemy. Now, 
the colour of the cap back then used to tell you the game was played against. So if you've got a red cap like this, it's against Wales. Um, if you get a white cap against Ireland, a blue cap, it's against the Scottish. Now, what makes this really, really important? It was the only cap that folks ever won. One of the greatest goalkeepers of his day, won the league championship, a couple of FA Cups, played for the Football League. Very, very prominent character, but outspoken. And in those days, he wouldn't have been England manager. It was a team of selectors that picked the team. Um, that cap's against Wales, and it's 1897. So that should tell you, if you've been listening, that that's the one and only England cap ever won by one of the most famous football players ever. Uh, that's William Henry Fulks. This belongs to one of our patrons in the museum, Dan Dale, Don Dickinson. So thanks, Don, for letting us get out of the cabinet. Normally, when you find these caps, they're in beautiful condition because you can't wear them. They're not really designed to wear. Uh, people would fold them up, put them in a drawer, wrap them in cotton, wrap them in uh, paper and keep the colours. This one looks like it's been through the wars and there's a reason for that. Folks was a bit unorthodox in the terms of which he did things. And he used to let his son Redvers play football in the local park wearing that. So that's his only ever England cap. There's no real story as to why he never got picked again. Um, we can only hazard that he was quite a dangerous character uh, with his opinion and his antics. Who knows? But that game was played here at Bramall Lane, England won 4-0. Going back to Jack Jones. Um, it didn't work out for him at Sheffield United. Made a few appearances, but uh, was straining at the leash to go somewhere else. Now, uh, Secretary Joe Wustenhoe made an arrangement uh, with the County Cricket Club. Oh, sorry, with Rugby School for him to teach cricket there uh, as a sort of favour for him to keep him sweet. I think he was a decent football player. Um, Tottenham Hotspur came in for him. And in those days, they were in the Southern League and he decided to join Spurs and it was an uproar. Because they were in the Southern League and therefore non-league, they could sign him without a fee, apparently. So he went to Spurs and the directors at Bramall Lane weren't too happy. Now he served Spurs well, seven seasons I think at Tottenham. But even more embarrassingly, uh, he came to be their captain. Now 1901, and here's another ball link for you, Sheffield United's FA Cup final opponents were Spurs. And the first game was played down at the Crystal Palace, which was a record crowd until the first game was played at Wembley. There's another link coming up here for you. Um, it went to a replay. And the replay, now Tottenham playing Sheffield United, who knows what a suitable venue would have been in 1901. Um, Villa Park, I think, was just about open then. Maybe Molyneux, maybe even Derby County. That was used for semis or Forest. But in their infinite wisdom, something the FA for the venue for the FA Cup final replay, picked Burnham Park, home of Bolton Wanderers. Uh, and I've told the story before, but it's a great one. With the record crowd that had watched it at Crystal Palace the week before, all the tradesmen, the butchers, the bakers, the candlestick makers of Bolton thought, aye, aye, we're gonna make some money out of this game. And if you ever went to Burnham Park, you sort of went up from the old railway station up into the town, and the ground was there, and shops along the way. So they set all these stalls up, on the way to the ground for this huge crowd they were going to get, selling their wares, feeding people, watering people, and the official crowd for the game was 18,284. Um, a lot of the food got wasted. In Bolton to this day, they still refer to it as Pie Saturday, the day the, uh, the pies got wasted. Spurs won, captained by Jack Jones, who'd walked out of Sheffield United for no signing fee to a Southern League club, and set the record that we became thus far the last team to lose an FA Cup final to an amateur side or a non-league side as a professional club. So thanks for that, Jack. Um, 1923, Sheffield United's FA Cup semi-final opponents, Bolton Wanderers. And that game was played at Old Trafford, which again was a huge crowd. Um, United lost that game 1-0 to what was described as a looping goal from a player who went on to become very, very famous indeed. His name was David Jack, David Bone Jack. Um, started his career at Bolton, did really well with them. They were one of the cup sides of the 1920s. Had a fantastic goalkeeper called Dick Pym, whose son I met once by a complete accident in Exeter when I was training down there in another lifetime. Uh, we got talking to an old boy at the bar and he said, do you like your football? Yeah, we do. Um, who do you support? Sheffield United. My dad played against you in the FA Cup semi-final and won. Uh, and on his watch chain, I think it was three FA Cup winners medals he got with Bolton in the 20s, Dick Pym. And he told us he used to go fishing on the River X in his FA Cup final jerseys and use them for going out in the cold, which was brilliant. But we lost. And the team that won went uh, through was Bolton. 
to play West Ham United in the first ever Wembley Cup FA Cup final. Now here's another link for you. Prior to that game, that was a record crowd, is the famous pictures of Billy the White Horse uh, on the pitch, trying to hurt people back with encroach at the field of playing that game. That broke the record of the 1901 FA Cup final first game against Tottenham that went to a replay at Burnham Park Bolton. So we've got these little tenuous links going on all the time between the two. A um, few players played down the years. I always think the best story is Malcolm Barris, who in the 50s was one of Bolton Wanderers' great centre-halves. Fantastic player, big and strong, played for England, won the FA Cup. Uh, when Joe Mercer became the Blades manager, um, one of our defenders at that time was a little known player called Joe Shaw. And um, for some reason, Joe Mercer decided he didn't fancy Joe, wasn't big enough for what he wanted, wasn't physical enough. So, in quite a big transfer deal, Joe went to Bolton Wanderers and signed Malcolm Barris. Uh, and to induce Barris to come to Sheffield United, the board of directors worked with news agents, I think, in Sheffield as a business. So, he got another income away from uh, playing football. And Joe was dropped, much to the dismay of the fans. Joe, even at that point, was one of the real darlings of Sheffield United Football Club, and quite rightly so. Um, my understanding is that we went on an unprecedented run of defeats with Malcolm playing. Great player, just went wrong. Uh, to the point where the crowd were really on Joe Mercer's back. And in the end, he reinstated Joe. And the minute Joe Shaw got back in, fortunes turned. And of course, Joe went on to become the all-time appearance maker for the Blades. And a bloke who really, really does deserve the accolade of being a club legend. So, on the eve of the game against Bolton, we hope it warms up. We hope you enjoy it. We started with an England, well, we didn't start with England International. We started with the idea to open Bramall Lane. Then we talked about England International, Fatty Folks, Jack Jones, FA Cup final replays, FA Cup semi finals, and finally Malcolm Barris. Uh, on behalf of us all at the Football Club, thank you for your support. Enjoy the game, and hopefully, we'll speak to you again soon.